Bibles, if you would, open up to 1 Samuel chapter number 17. 1 Samuel 17. That's where we'll be this morning. First Samuel 17. I will tell you, it has been a crazy week at my house. Uh, it, we have a running joke in our house that any time that I have to speak in the morning to put your seatbelt on and hold fast because that week's going to be a crazy ride, and it has been. It has been a, uh, an insanely up and down uh, busy week, um, uh, just a, a small snippet of, uh, of, our, of my week. Um, I had a couple major uh, uh, appointments at work, meetings at work, and, and uh, I was, they were trying to move them around on the schedule, and all of them this week. Uh, this past week. Um, so then Monday morning, I was like, well, you know, I had to get my oil changed, so I went and got, tried to get my oil changed, and uh, my transmission stopped working. And uh, come to find out, it was uh, it was a $18 linkage part that was no big deal, but for about three or four hours there, I was like, all right, Lord, <laughs> 4000 bucks is not fun to spend on uh, on, on something that I can't see or play, uh, play with, or, you know, it's just, it's... Not, uh, not, not that much fun, but it has been a crazy week. It also is a reminder that we need to pray for our, our pastors more uh, because they are constantly under attack. I've got, I get a small microcosm of what they experienced on a daily basis, so an encouragement uh, to pray for them. I'm going to open up in a word of prayer, and just so you know how the lesson's going to go this morning, um, this is a lesson you guys already know. We're talking about David and Goliath. So we're not covering any new ground, okay? So there's not some earth-shattering passage of scripture that I'm going to come across that we're going to read, and you're going to be like, wow, that was an amazing story. You already know, most of you in here, the majority in here should know this story. Um, but this was a passage of scripture that I, I studied with the teens here just a couple weeks back, and I have not been able to, I've not been able to let it go. It has, it has sat in my mind, it has marinated in my mind, and even when Pastor Scott um, asked me to speak this morning, this was the passage that God gave me peace about speaking on. This is a different look at the passage, but it's, it's a personalization of, of the actual actions that David goes through. Um, so as we go through this, that's why I kind of started off the service this morning uh, the way that I did. If your heart is not prepared for the service this morning, we're going to cover verses that you already know, and it's going to be very easy to get complacent in your view of what is being covered, okay? Um, I could bring my daughter up here right now and say, hey, okay, tell me the story of David and Goliath. And she could do it, okay? So I don't want us to get into the idea of the story, but in the application of what, uh, of what David went through. So we will, we're not going to cover the entire story, but we will cover uh, part of it. Uh, but we're in 1 Samuel 17. I'm going to open up in a word of prayer, and then we'll we'll start. We'll go through the we'll go through the lesson. We'll go through the the story of David, and then we'll go through some application of it. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, again, I do thank you for this morning, Lord. You have given us the opportunity to gather in your house. You have given us the opportunity to have your word, and Lord, you need to be here. Lord, our minds need to be here. Our hearts need to be aligned with you. Lord, this is your Bible. This is your church. This is your lesson. This, you are, uh, Lord, our God. And God, I pray as we go through this lesson that our hearts would be reminded, would be challenged, would be stirred to draw closer to you, to step out in faith, to, to do the things that we know are right. God, I thank you for the opportunities you put in front of us. I thank you for your goodness and grace and mercy. Be with us this morning. Lord, may your word go out powerfully around the world today. In thy name we pray. Amen. I love, I, I love being married. I love, uh, I love the, the life of, of a family. I love all of those things. I love the many stages of life that we have gone through. Now, I am in my mid-40s, so I haven't gone through all of the stages yet, but I've, got, I've enjoyed each and every one. Each stage of my life after college is what I would say it, after my single life, has been, has been exciting. Uh, and each of them has different blessings in them. When, I, when Carrie and I were first married, we lived in New Hampshire, <clears throat> which was a great place to live, lots of stuff to do. Um, and I can remember there was distinctly times that we would come home on Friday afternoon, 
and uh, I would, she would pull in the driveway, and, and I would be waiting for her because I was teaching school at the time, so I'd get home before her. And I would say, hey, what do you want to do this weekend? And she'd be like, let's go to the mountains. I'm like, great, let's go to the mountains. And, and we would run upstairs, and we'd pack our bags, and we'd throw them in the car, and we'd leave. Five, ten minutes, tops. No reservations, no idea where we were going, just go. That was awesome. Okay, then you have kids, not that kids aren't, but that kind of goes to the wayside. Uh, because you can't exactly, especially when you first get married, let's be honest. When you first get married, everybody gives you everything, right? You get, you get like a complete set of everything. You get, you know, the strollers and the every, everything else. I feel so bad now when I see mothers walking through like Walmart and they're carrying the, the, the big car seat and the, the strollers. Well, to go anywhere with a child, even, a, even a, just a small infant, takes up your whole back of your car, it takes planning, you gotta, you gotta make sure you have all the right foods and diapers and, and, and Lord help you if you, if you forgot the, the, the binkies or pacifiers and all of those things, the favorite toys that, 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 they, that they have. But you do enjoy the child, you enjoy them being a baby, you enjoy all of those, you know, the, the loves and the snuggles and all of those things. And now that the kids get older, you, you enjoy them differently. Now, I, I, I loved the kids when they were small, and I loved them when they were little. I can remember teaching Brandon and Connor and Drew, you know, how to throw a baseball and shoot a basketball, and loved all of those things. But there's one thing that has changed over time. They've gotten older. They've gotten more responsible, somewhat more responsible, um, and they've started to, to, to grow in maturity. But there was a stage there where Carrie and I were trying to decide if we could kind of go back to being like we were before the kids were married. If, you know, if, you're, if you're a parent, you understand what I mean. The kids are at that 12 to 13 year range and you're like, can we leave them at home? <laughs> and any parent that has gone through this knows what this is like. Now, you, you, you have to build up your child to get to this point, obviously. And I can remember uh, Carrie and I having this conversation and, and it's just, it's a funny conversation. You sit there and you're, in, you're, you're like, can we do this? Can we, can we leave the house with them here? But will the house be retained in the same state that it is? And you sit there and you talk about it and you're like, well, let's, let's try it. And, 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 and you, say, you say to the kids, you're like, okay, hey, we're going to just run to Walmart five minutes down the road. And then it, the, the funny thing is you get in the car and it's almost like you're dating again. You're sitting there looking at each other like, what are we going to do? This all this time and we got to run to Walmart and, and you're excited about it. And you, you start driving and then you pull out of the neighborhood and then what immediately happens? You worry. Carrie looks at me and she goes, do you think they're going to burn it down? <laughs> Knowing my kids probably. I don't, I don't know. It's insured. Who cares? Uh, at that point, I'm like, I'm like, I think they're going to be fine. It, it, what do, do, should we call them? I'm like, we just left. I can still see the house. <laughs> and then you go to Walmart, you get your groceries, and you do all of that, and you come home, and, and you walk in the house, and the kids are in the same spot that you left them, <laughs> whether that's in front of the TV or outside playing, and, 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 and they're there. And, and, and over time, that grows. Now you get to go grocery shopping together, and you get to go on date nights. And those are, it, when you go on a date night and you don't have to pay for babysitting, that is a huge, that, that's a big deal. You're like, this is, you don't have to bring them anywhere. You don't have to deposit them anywhere. It's, you don't have to pick them. They're at home. You just leave them, and it's great. And, 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 and then, but then what do you do on a date night? You, you gotta, if you're going out for dinner, you then have to provide dinner for your child, so, so then the, the whole thought process, you know, I'm, I am more of the line of, they got frozen pizzas, they got an oven, who cares? And my wife's like, they don't know how to use the oven yet. And I'm like, so you got to walk through that. So it, it's exciting, and, and you go through that. And, and now we're at a point now in our lives where yesterday we grabbed the keys and we had to run, do some running around, and we're leaving. That's what we said. We, it, it, loud enough, and I think one of our sons was like, okay, no expectation of time return, no expectation of anything, we just left. And it was amazing. 
Now, I love being able to do that. I love, I love, it, it, we're at a point now where we could leave for a week. I know the Siglers, you guys just left for a week or so. That, that's, a, that's, that's great to be able to do that, to be able to leave your ki- kids and know that they're going to do it. Well, what happened over that time? What happened over the last 15 years or, or 20 years of our life? Well, we've been building the kids up to that. I mean, I could, I could come home tomorrow and say to, my, to Carrie, I'm like, you know, hey, I want a vacation. We're going we're gonna to leave for a week. And I wouldn't think two things about it, about leaving the kids at home. Why? Well, because we have put trust in them over time. We started small, five-minute trip. We've gotten to the point where we can be gone for hours at a time. We can be gone for a whole day. Nothing happens. Overnight, doesn't matter. And the kids are able to do that. Why? Because they have grown in their responsibility. We can trust them because they can take on more responsibility because they succeeded in the tasks. We've never had one incident, really, of any significance. So what happens? Well, they, it's, a, it's a double benefit. We get blessed because we get to go and do what we, need, what we need to do. The boys get to afternoon free or get to do whatever they want um, while we're gone, and, and that's relaxing for them. Now you say, Mr. Adam, or Adam, how, how do, I'm sorry, if I say Mr. Adam, it's because I work with the teens so much. Um, but if, if you say, Adam, so what's the deal with, the, well, in, in, in 1 Samuel, you find out something. Before David was able to fight Goliath, he was preparing, God was preparing him to fight Goliath. Let's read through the passage. We're going to read through, we're just going to talk through the lesson, talk through what happens with David first, and then we will go back and get our application for us here. So we're in, in 1 Samuel 17. Let's read through a little bit of the passage here. In verse number 17, in verse number 34, it says this. Just so we get the mindset, you have, and, and maybe there's someone here that, that doesn't know the story of David and Goliath. You have uh, the Philistines were a company, or were they, was a country that was against the that was fighting against the Jewish people at this time, and they had uh, attacked. And instead of having the armies attack, you, they decided to have a man-on-man war, is what they many war a challenge, if you will. And here comes Goliath. He was about ten foot tall. He was he, he was a, a massive. Uh, a warrior, he, he was, a, and, and what they basically said was, hey, instead of us killing each other and getting a lot of bloodshed, how about we just leave it up to two guys? We'll bring Goliath, you bring whoever you want. Okay, so that's where we are. Now, what the Israel, uh, Israelites, uh, Israeli soldiers saw was this massive man, and they looked and they said, man, I'm scared of that. That dude's big. I, I don't want to go against that. And literally, you had people cowering in fear. So now you have the, 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 the king at the time, Saul, challenges his people and says, hey, whoever is going to go out, I'll give you a reward. And you, talk, and you read through the rewards, it's pretty incredible. He talks about taxation free. He talks about, he gives up one of his daughters, I believe, in money and all this other, it, and still nobody is willing to do it. Well, then you have David. David comes on the scene, and David uh, raises his hand, And you think, wow, David must be this massive person and and warrior. He was a teenager with a slingshot, with no battle experience. Let's read through it. In verse number 17, uh, chapter number 17, verse number 34, it says this, And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, And there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. So here you have David talking about a story from his past. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered him out of his mouth. And when when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant both slew both the, the lion and the bear and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said unto David, go, and the Lord be with thee. Point number one for this morning is, David was faithful in his job or his task. If you look in verse number 34, it says this, And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept 
his father's sheep. Now, to me, you that may not be that, that may not be that big of a deal. But if you if you if you skip back a couple verses in verse number fourteen, same chapter seventeen, verse fourteen and fifteen, it says this. And David was the youngest of the three eldest, followed Saul. But David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And then if you skip back even further in chapter number 16, you have in verse number 11 and 12, it says, And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are, there, are, are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for he will he will not sit for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent him and brought him brought him in. And now he was of, uh, he was ruddy and withal a beautiful countenance and a goodly to look at. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Now in each of these passages, you see that David is in charge of the sheep. Now. For us in today's society, that doesn't seem like that big of a deal. In fact, I've heard many, uh, I've heard a number of teachers that over the years that have taught that, well, David was with the sheep. He was, he was almost like he was punished to be with the sheep. But in actuality, if you look at it, why was, what was David doing? David was in charge of and protecting the life of his family. These people were shepherds. These people were in charge of, of maintaining a flock. And they put David in charge of, of these sheep. He knew that these sheep were valuable. He protected them. He supported them. He took care of them. He fed them. He took his time with them. And ultimately, he was in charge of them. Now... That doesn't seem like that big of a deal until you realize how massive these sheep herds were. You realize what these guys had to do. They were wandering around in the, out, out in the wilderness, not wandering. They knew where they were going. They, they, they had a, a plan, and they were, they were constantly moving the sheep from uh, one pasture to the next and, and finding water for them and, 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 and really spending time with them out in the middle of, of nowhere away from the protection of home, away from the protection of, uh, of their family and, and, and all the buildings that were there. And they were there alone, willingly. But they understood one thing. Those sheep were extremely valuable to their family, to their families to success, to their family's well-being, well to their family's lifeline. And what do you see David do? You see David take his job seriously. So seriously that a special guest shows up at their house. Samuel. That would be like the president of the United States, regardless of how you feel of him. At least the person that is in that, 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 that title. Showing up at your house and saying, hey, I want to have lunch with you and I want to meet your family. And David says, or they, David is out with the sheep. Normally in these situations, what would you have? You would, you would have the house prepared, and you would have all of your family there, and they would be cleaned and showered, and, and, and everybody in their best dressed, and, and, and you would sit down with that person, and you would talk, and you would spend time with them. Where was David? Out with the sheep. Why was David out with the sheep? Because it was important. It was important to his family. It was important to him. It was important to protect everything that was, was around those sheep. Now, ultimately, you see that David is chosen to be the next king, and uh, I, I still, don't, reading through it, you kind of get the impression that he, he doesn't necessarily understand everything that's involved there, but he understands one thing. He's got to get back out to the sheep. If you just got anointed by a prophet back in this time and told that the idea of you being the next king, I know these teenage guys, I know my teenage boys. If somebody came into our house and said, hey, uh, you guys are going to be, a, it's a pretty important, pretty big deal here. Uh, you're going to be the next king and the next ruler of the, of the country. And then I turned to him and said, hey, you know, the lawn needs to be mowed. What's their response? Uh, the next ruler of the United States of America doesn't mow lawns anymore. I'm sorry. I'm not taking job applications now for that. 
And every and, and, and why? Because that's the natural instinct. What was David's instinct? Go back out with the sheep. Protect the family. Protect the goodness of the family. So our first point here is David was faithful in the job that he took, in the job that he had, in the task that he was performing. Well, what else about David? What else can we learn from this, this simple story of David and Goliath? Well, the second thing we learn is David had the proper perspective and recognition of challenges in his life. You read through the, the, the passage, and we've read through it, so I don't want to necessarily read it through again. We'll, we'll, go, through, we'll go through it, but you see that what, how David talks about this challenge, this testing, this trial that is put in front of him. And it's very interesting that he uses words in the Bible. When you're reading through the Bible, do not take lightly the, the style of words that are used. There's a purpose in every word in the Bible. And it's very easy to gloss over those words and to, and to take those words and, and minimize them. But in David's actions here, let's read through this, and, and just so you can get to the idea here, what happens? Well, if you read through it, you, you understand what happens. In, in verse number 34, he says, He kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. Okay, let's just stop there. A lion and a bear took one lamb. What are you doing? What are you doing if you're doing the sheep and they take one lamb? You got hundreds. There's one. It's a lion and a bear. Think about it. I'm looking at it going, it's a write-off at this point. I, 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 th I think, we're, <laughs> think we're acceptable. We're good. Well, what you don't understand is what happens when the lion is done with the first one? comes back for the next one. And guess where they go? Right back to the same point where they, where they got the first one. It was a tasty one, so let's go back to that same place. There was, a, there was an opportunity where David sees this, this, this lion and this bear, and, they, and they, 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 they take them. Now, what does David say? In verse number 34, it says, it says they came out and they took, the, they took the lamb. In verse number 35, and I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. If you're looking at these words, he, first off, David identifies the challenges that he was facing. It says a lion and a bear. But then what does he also identify? He identifies action that he took. If this was a hired man, if this was somebody that was hired by the family, and they saw a lion and a bear, good chances they were not going to be chasing after him. But David knew the value. He knew the value in the lamb. He knew the value in destroying the, the lion and the bear because he knew that he had to protect the, his family's sheep, his family's well-being, his personal well-being. And he was faithful in it. David went out with power with confidence. And if you look through the rest, of the, uh, the rest of the verses, what do you see? David recognizes exactly how this was. Uh, now, I, I, nothing against uh, uh, any young person or even, e even adult male in here, but I'm telling you what, I kill a lion and a bear, I'm taking a lot of that credit. I mean, you think about that. He killed a lion and a bear. How would you be walking around? I'd be walking around telling everybody about what I did. I mean, that's, that's, my, that's my flesh. That's a, the, the confidence of that. The, 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 you don't understand what I did. I killed a lion and a bear. And what does David say? Well, it's very interesting what David says in verse number 37. The Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. David not only used active action, meaning he, he, he took purpose in what he was doing, but he also recognized who it was that gave him victory. He did not take credit for the victory. Who did he say? What did he say? Well, he says, the Lord delivered him. The Lord allowed him to have victory. 
See, David had the proper perspective of this bear and this lion. He saw the bear and the lion, and what did, he, what did he see? He saw an opportunity for the Lord to use him to protect his family's well-being. And what did he do? He ran out after these things. He caught the lion by the, by the, the beard. So this was not a small lion. This was not a, a, a baby lion, if you will. This was somebody that, that, this is the exact opposite of what should have happened. So point number one was, David was faithful in his job and his task. Number two, David had the proper perspective and recognition of the trials and the victory that he had. And point number three is, David's faith in trials allowed God to use him miraculously to save a nation. So David's faithfulness in trials allowed God to use him. David now recognizes how God worked in his life previously and how God would, be, would continue to use him mightily. If you look in verse number 7, again, he says unto him, he says, he will, deliver me out of the hand, he will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine. David understands and recognizes God's goodness in his life. David recognizes victory before the trial is even completed. Why? Because God proved himself. David allowed God to prove himself when he conquered the lion and the bear. And by having that confidence, what then happens? Well, God gives him an opportunity to stand in front of a giant and save a nation. Because of David's humility, because of David's meekness. Now, those are two words you don't hear with, with, with the, the idea of a warrior. But the reality is, David showed ultimate humility and ultimate meekness in the words that he uses. Because ultimately, a humble man and a meek man does not take credit for the things that God does. He recognizes his inefficiencies, and he recognizes God's strength. And because he is able to do that, God is able to continue to use him. Well, it's very interesting. You skip down even further in chapter number 17 and verse number 45 through 49. This is David comes out and he comes out and, you, and, and if you, you don't know the story, he, he comes into this field and, and, the, and, the, and Goliath the giant is standing there and David has an opportunity to talk to him, which is, which I love this. I lo this, is what, this is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. This is the ultimate biblical trash talk. <laughs> okay. This is if you know what trash talking is, it's in sports, and you, you kind of you, you jaw at each other, and, and usually it's in good taste, and, and sometimes it can't be. But this is David walking out with the power of God and standing in front of uh, Goliath, and they have this discourse back and forth to each other. But in verse number forty-five, it says this: Then David, and then said David unto the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, and with a spear, and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver me, deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee. And I will give the, the carcass of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of earth and, and all that earth may, uh, may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, but for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came to drew nigh to meet David, that, he, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in the bag and, and took thence a stone and slang it, and smote the Philistine in the forehead, and the stone sunk into, into his forehead and fell upon the face of the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone, and smote the Philistine and slew him. And there was no sword in the hand of David. And, and, and therefore David ran and took the took a, and th therefore David ran and took upon the Philistine and, and took the sword and drew it out of his sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith, where there Therewith. Now you find out here that before the battle, who is David recognizing? God. He's saying, God will give this to me, not me. He's not saying, I, this would, be, this would have been the time. 
this would have been the time for David to stand there and with his with, with his chest puffed up and 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 walking around as if he he was he was filled with his own self righteousness and confidence and saying, "I killed the bear and I killed the lion and I'm going to kill you." I mean, it sounds great, but it's absolute selfishness and pride. What does David say? David said, "The Lord will deliver me." And did you catch how he wrote, how he says this? What is the purpose of this? That God would be glorified. That God would be glorified in the land. That God would be glorified by the, the armies of Israel. That God would be glorified and known and that the power of God would go out and be known around the world. And you start looking at it that way and you start seeing that in, in trials, God... It, because David was prepared for these trials, because, God, because he allowed God to use him in the small things, God ultimately was able to use him in the great things. Just like when we had, at the beginning of my lesson today, you start off the kids small with a, a five-minute trip away from the house and, and, and a, a couple-hour trip away from the house and an overnight trip away from the house. and Now they're on their own. They know how to, how to live. They know, you can trust them. Why? Because you have built up their confidence. They, there's faith and there's trust in each other. But here David was, be, was able to be used by God, and he was, being, he was able to, to allow God to work in his life. He was able to recognize God's goodness. Even after all the victory, after all of the things that God did in his life, what was he recognizing? He recognized God. He didn't even recognize necessarily his part in the victory. He recognized God using him in that victory. God ultimately used a job as a shepherd and the trials of being a shepherd with the challenges of, of going against a bear and a lion to prepare David for how he would use him later on in life and ultimately to save the nation of Israel. I love the story of David. But how does that apply to us? Taking the same three, uh, same three thoughts from David, let's go back through this and, and kind of look at this from an application standpoint. Number one, David with his, with his sheep and, and the idea of, of that focus of, uh, uh, of how that looks. David was faithful in his job and his task. Are we diligent in our task, in our job of pursuing Christ and living a life that is honoring and glorifying to Christ? Well, what is our job? Our job is to have a relationship with God. Our job is to allow God to work through us. Our, jo our, our, our job is to, is to study God's word and to know him. We say, I don't have those things. Well, you're lacking two things. You're lacking either a love for God or you're lacking the importance of what this means in your life. See, David saw the importance of, of uh, protecting the sheep. He was willing to run out and to challenge a bear and a lion. Why? Because he knew the importance of it. He knew the importance of what it meant to be a Christian. Oh, no, I'm sorry, not a Christian. What it meant to be a, a, a good shepherd and taking care of his family and his sheep. Well, what about us? Why do you not do your devotions? Why do you not walk with the Lord? Well, I don't have time. I'm, I'm really busy. So you just told me you, you don't recognize the importance of doing your devotions and walking with the Lord. Do you realize the importance that this has on your life? Do you realize how frail your life is? Do you realize the, the, the actions of your, uh, of your relationship with God directly impact every facet of your life? Your relationship with your wife, your relationship with your children, your work ethic, the way that you think, the way that you talk, the way that you treat others, the way that you uh, control your emotions, the way that your thought life, the way that you, you perceive, the, the, make decisions for the future. Everything that is involved in your life is, should be based on the backing of God's word yeah. and your relationship with God. Tell me again why you don't have time. Because you don't recognize the importance of it. You don't recognize the love for it. 
I have a, a box of, of letters. Uh, Pastor Scott talks about a box of letters that him and Carol have. Miss, e. Car- Miss Carrie and I had, back in the day, we didn't have cell phones and text messages and all that other stuff, so we had to write these letters to uh, ourselves. Not to ourselves, to each other. <laughs> that was a... Carrie, I used to write letters to myself and act like a... No, anyways. Um, I used to, I, we used to write letters to, to each other, and it, there was this thing called Panhellenic Mail at, at Pensacola when we went there, and we would get these letters. Um, first off, the letters were just, it was funny because the, the guys' letters, uh, guys would spray cologne on their letters, and the girls would spray, it, 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 and these bags smelled just like a terrible mess of, it was off. Anyways, these, these letters would come to our, 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 our rooms, and they would knock on our door. And they would say, Panhellenic, you got mail. And I'd, be, and I'd jump out of my, my, my bunk or, or you know, wake up or whatever it was I was doing. And I'd run over and I'd get the letter. And I would open the letter. And it's just a small note, you know, something simple. But I read that note once. Read it again. And then, I, and then you start analyzing the note. There's a comma here. Is there a reason for the comma? She says she, 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 would enjoy to, to, she enjoys time, comma. Does that mean that she's, and this is what happens when you're dating, this is what would happen. Now, you guys get the text messages, you guys don't even understand this. You get to get a text message and FaceTime and all that other fun stuff you get to. And I would sit there all night long, and I would read it, and then I would reread it, and then I would read it again. And then before I went to bed, I'd read it again, and then I'd, I'd be, you know, whatever I, my perception of the letter was would help me as I went through the next day, and, and I'd be so excited to see her. And I saved these letters. I don't know why I saved them. Miss Carrie and I have talked about having a bonfire and throwing them in there before, because there's nothing bad there or anything like that, but it's just, I read these, and I'm like, oh my goodness, you, you, why would I write that? I, it just, it's so sappy, and, and, and anyways... I used a thesaurus. I just know that much when I when I when I wrote mine. But I understand that the love that I had for her and the love that I had in getting that note and that letter. Nobody was going to take that note from me. Nobody was going to take it out of my hands. Nobody was going to destroy that note. And I read that note as if it was something that was the most important thing in my life. This is your love note from God. Do you love it? Do you love him? Do you love him enough that you love his word? See, God asks us, God requires of us to be diligent in our tasks. Our tasks prepare us for the challenges that are coming. And if you're not diligent in your task, you won't be prepared nor are you going to be ready for the opportunity for God to use you. So our, in our lives, are we prepared? Are we diligent in our tasks? As these, as these trials and testings come up, just like it with David and the, and, the, and the bear and the lion, do we have the proper perspective of trials in our life? Here you had David, he saw this lion and this bear that, that should have caused him to, to, to flee. But ultimately, what did David see? He didn't see a lion and a bear. What did he see? He saw, an, he saw someone taking from his family, he saw taking from the goodness of his life, but he also recognized that his God was bigger than those animals. And he saw an opportunity for God to use him and use him mightily. Now the proper perspective that we, we have is this. I know that in this room, some of you in here are going through massively heavy trials in your life. And understand that I may, know, uh, may not know of many that are going, anything that in, in your life person, but I know that each of us has trials. But we make our trials as big as we want to. It's just a matter of what you're focused on. I used a silly illustration with the teens the other day. If you can wink your eye and take one finger, all right? Everybody try it. I know we're doing something in Sunday morning. This is not, I know it's uncharacteristic, but I'm an uncharacteristic person. So take your eye, wink, put your finger way out here. Look around. Can you see everybody still with your one eye? 
Yeah, kind of. Yeah, you get, you get that. Now take the one finger and put it directly in front of your eye. And what can you see? Let me ask you something. Did the finger size change? No, Adam. Why? Well, what's the difference? If it's out here or if it's here. This is the focus of my, of my vision. This is not. Our trials and our testings that we are going through, our trials and our challenges in our life are as big as we want them to be. Do you want them to be out here or do you want them to be here? The challenge is, are we willing to trust God to do what he says he will do and leave our trials and our, and our, and our, and our situations with him? Allow him to work through it so that we can sit there at the end of the trial and say, God did this in my life. God showed me the goodness of his life. God showed me the victory. And in him, I, I can see that. I can see his goodness. The flesh wants us to, to focus on our trials. The flesh wants us to be consumed by our, our, our issues and to, and to cause it to affect our whole life. Did you notice when, when David saw the trials, whether it's the bear or the lion or Goliath, what did he do? He was active. He ran, he caught, he, he slew, he, he, he charged, he, he did something active. Well, if you guys are anything like me, I can tell you this much. When a trial and a heavy trial comes up, what's our reaction? Our reaction is to stop. Our reaction is to put this down. Our reaction is to not come to church or have a desire to go to church. Our reaction is to pull away from people. Our reaction is to walk away from the things that we know are right. What has happened? Our focus. Instead of focusing on what we should with God, what do we do? We focus on the trial. We allow it to consume us. As many times I talk with the teenagers, a lot of them sleep a lot. I can remember being a teenager, and I, I, every now and then I'd sleep in too. You know, get up just in time for lunch, you know, that whole thing. But one of the things that you see in teenagers is when they're struggling with things, they have an inclination to go to sleep. They have an inclination to separate themselves, and it's very easy to see it in teenagers. But as quick as I point out to the teenagers, I say it's the same thing with adults. We pull back from God. We pull back from church. We pull back from people that can be a positive encouragement to us. We spend time with, away, from, away from everybody and we consume ourselves in our trials. In trials, we need to force ourselves to be active with the Lord. Do you think David's flesh wanted to attack the, the, the lion and the bear and, the, and, and, and Goliath? No, his, his, his reaction, his, his fleshly re desire would have been to flee. But he recognized God's strength, and in that strength, what did he recognize? He recognized his need to fight, his need to grow, his need to push through, his need to impact. Because ultimately, the more that we fight for ourselves and our relationship with God, we are fighting for our families, we are fighting for our marriages, we are fighting for our children, we are fighting for our church, we are fighting for our jobs, and, and, and the impact that we can have on those around us all by changing our perspective. Point number two is, do we have the proper perspective of trials? Point number three is this, and it's the, the same thing with uh, point number three for, for David, is it, God ultimately is preparing us and wants to use us to accomplish mighty things. Our problem is we dream too small or we forget what God has done. I've heard it said a number of times and even uh, I can remember over the years my, my mother has, has challenged me and many pastors have challenged from this pulpit and from other pulpits to write down God's goodness. Why? Why do we, why do we need to write down God's goodness? Why do we re need to write down victory? Why do we need to write down praises? Because we forget. We forget how good God is. In the midst of a trial... We forget how good God is. We forget the, 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 the victory that God gave us. And many times we end up taking credit for what God has done. 
There's been times in my life even that I've seen that I've, I've conquered something and I, and I catch myself very quick to take credit for something that God did. And it has nothing to do with, it's all rooted in pride and, and, and selfishness. Instead of taking the proper approach of what David took, and he recognized God. He recognized God's goodness. And he recognized God's ability through victory. It had nothing to do with him. Ultimately, we are being prepared for something. If you're alive here today, which I think is just about everybody in this room, Right, teenagers? Okay. All right. Uh, everybody's alive today. God's preparing you for something. You say, Adam, I, I'm a teenager. Yeah, I get it. God's preparing you for something. Well, I, I have a family. God's preparing you for something. Mr. Adam, I, I am a, I'm a senior citizen. If you're still alive, God's preparing you for something. Until he's done using you, he's preparing you for something. So don't get this idea that you're done. Don't get this idea that you can't. What are those? Those are excuses. Those are excuses that the flesh comes up with to justify your, you not doing what God tells you to do. So God is preparing all of us. We must simply stay diligent in our walk with the Lord. Have the proper perspectives in our trials and allow God to use us the song in, the, in, in, in Scripture, is uh, just a phrase from there, is we are more than conquerors through him who loved us so. Not through our own actions, not through our own devices, not through our own desires, but through his. Do we recognize that? Do we utilize that? Do we apply that to our life? If you are here this, this morning and you are unsaved and you know nothing about what it means to, to live a life that's honoring and glorifying to God, let me tell you something. God loves you. God wants to have this relationship with you to allow you to access what he has as far as power to overcome those trials, to overcome those issues that you have. He has a desire to know you. He sent his son to die on the cross for you. He has a plan for you if you would just simply allow him to do that. What about us who are saved? Have we lost the importance of our task? Have we lost the, the love that we should have? Are we actively doing and giving credit to God for all the things that he does in our lives? Are we looking for opportunities for God to use us, to challenge us, to push us. When was the last time God pushed you to step out in faith? Well, it's been a long time. There might be a reason for that. God ultimately is preparing each of us to be used. Let's make sure that we are prepared to be used mightily from him. Let's pray.